Hi, I hope you guys are all staying healthy and safe. Back in session with Professor P. Today is a really great chapter. Remember we last chapter we talked about applied anthropology, making things useful, applying it, helping to solve global social problems. Medical anthropology is a really cool field because the medical anthropology, they want to analyze health and illness both socially and biologically to reduce human suffering. So it's a combination of the biological field and the cultural field to analyze different kinds of health issues, different the anal analysis of the body, of, you know, death. Of, and it really wants to take a cross-cultural sort of perspective in analyzing health, right? It becomes important to sort of understand what are some of the social and political factors behind it, right? How are people viewing illness? How are they viewing medicine? How are they viewing treatment, right? All of these are going to vary cross-culturally. All right, let's go, let's get to ethnomedicine. Ethnomedicine is those health-related beliefs, ideologies, knowledges, and practices of a cultural group. The definition is also in your book, but it's the beliefs and knowledges of a cultural group. What are they doing, right? How do they administer medicine? Where do they get the medicine? Are they going to local shamans, right? Is there a, you know, a local healer in their communities? What are their cultural theories about illness, right? What are their cultural theories about the body, right? There's so much stuff going on when we look at ethnomedicine. You guys come from the biological, the biomedicine, where you're going to go to Kaiser or John Muir, right? Ethnomedicine, think about this. Ethnomedicine are those types of healings that your great-grandmother might do, right? Something like Vicks, right? It heals everything, right? It could even cure cancer in some societies, right? Some of you guys might drink a lot of herbal teas because it's going to cure your stomach ache or, you know, you rub a lemon on a burn. These are all kinds of things that are, that are outside of actually taking medicine, like in the field of biomedicine. So that becomes important to sort of understand. The concept of the yin and the yang, right? Um, it's very old concept over... 3,000 years old, and it comes from uh, China, and it really is looking at keeping the body in balance. If you're hot, drink something cold. If you're cold, you know, drink something warm, right? It's really about that equilibrium. Your body needs to stay in balance so that it doesn't get sick. It's a lot more complicated than that. There's the living, you know, the, the world of the living and the underworld. It's a lot more complicated, but that's sort of the medical view on that. All right, let's get to biomedical paradigm. The biomedical paradigm is us. It's Western medicine. It refers to the dominant medical practice in the United States that's based on biology. We focus on disease. We focus on cures. Little interest is in the culture, right? What's important to understand is doctors aren't really analyzing the culture. They're analyzing parts of your body. If you go in and you say, I broke my foot, they're going to look at your foot. Right. That's not really about, you know, health. Health isn't the focus. Right. And that maintenance. Right. It's really about, you know, curing at the time. Many of us go to the doctor when we're sick or when we break something. It's not like, you know, we don't go to our regular oil changes. A lot of us. Right. To say, you know, we're going to keep our body in balance and make sure many of us don't. Many of us just say, well, no. We also in the United States focus on the germ theory. And the germ theory is basically saying germs are causing diseases. Right. Like I said, let me give you an example. We do know that there's very high, high rates of ovarian cancer in women in the Middle East because of their ideologies on the body, because they shroud, because they cover up, right? Their ideologies say, wait a minute, I can't have somebody look at that part of the body. So we're trying to get an understanding, right, of their approaches to increase healing. This is now... Um, been more accepted in the United States, right? Doing alternative medicine and working with anthropologists in the medical realm to understand how people view health. It's, it's, it's newer, but it's now becoming important. So that is a great thing. But we really focus on biomedicine, biological approaches and, and scientific approaches. All right, there's two camps of anthropologists that are talked about in this chapter in the medical field. The relativistic camp and the universal camp. The relativistic camp it's a camp of medical anthropologists that believes that culture is unique in its conception about health and illness and illness and the body. The second category is the universal camp. These are anthropologists that believe that there's a cross-cultural similarities in medical beliefs. So, 
for Native Americans using homeopathic medicine, um, they may use something that's similar to our Tylenol. Or they may use an herb that's similar to, to Advil. That they look at the similarities across culture in concepts about healing and say there's a lot of universals. So that becomes important to understand. All right. Personalistic practitioner. Personalistic practitioners are practitioners who deal with more than the body. They view illness as your social life being out of order. Maybe your bad behavior has caused your illness, right? And you may have to go to a practitioner to reverse that. Many of us don't go to personalistic practitioners in the United States, but they can be common cross-culturally. So that becomes important. All right, let's get to the four categories used by healers, whether it's a doctor, whether it's a shaman, whether it's a witch doctor, four categories. The first category is the naming process. Name the disease, name the illness. We all wanna know, do I have diarrhea? Or, right, am I, do I have the stomach flu, right? So we want it named. The second category is the personality of the healer of the doctor maybe, are they empathetic? Do they have a genuine interest? Can that correlate to your healing, right? Some of you may have had bad experiences at the, do at the doctor and may have said, it's the personality. They didn't care about me, right? Number three, the patient's expectations. Patient's expectations are your trip to the doc, the, your trip to the healer or to the doctor. What was the setting like? Um, what was the trainer's experience? How many of us really know a lot about our doctor? Or do we just go in randomly and we don't really know our doctor, right? Or have a doctor. The fourth one category is curing techniques. Are you going to take antibiotics, some type of drug therapy? You know, are you going to get shock treatment? You know, are you going to, you know, go in a hallucinogenic state? We don't know, but all of these categories exist across the board for healers. All right. Political and economic influences in health. What they're talking about in that part of the book. The political and economic influences in health is saying health is socially stratified. The wealthier are healthier people. Some of you may not believe that. That just means that people who are in poverty live in the conditions that may keep them ill. So you may lack resources, right? You may lack, you know, food. You know, you may be more susceptible to disease. You could be living in mold infested, you know, rooms. You know, you may be living in conditions that are, you know, uh, densely populated where the spread's gonna, you know, go. You So when we look at it, it's not to say people who don't have a lot of money aren't healthy. It's just to say that the poor are kept in conditions that can keep them unhealthy. They also may lack medical health care as well. So there's lots of things, right, that, that really go to the inequality and access to health care and inequality to health. We could even be talking about food, right? You know, what kind of food people are eating and, and you know, what they can acquire, right? What kind of resources they have. Do they even have access to one of the, we know one of the most lacking resources is to clean water. These are the kinds of things where we talk about health is socially stratified. All right, AIDS and HIV. What do you guys know about AIDS, AIDS and HIV? Do you guys think you got a pretty good grasp on it? Well, when we talk about AIDS and HIV in the United States, we sort of self-remove it. It's people in other countries dying from it, right? That's not the case. People in the United States between the age of 25 and 44 AIDS is the leading cause of death between people between the ages of 25 and 44 in the United States. If we know so much about it, people, why are these rates here? One of the things we want to talk about is, and in the book, you have to remember, they're only talking about the sexual transmission. Transmission. They're not talking about IV drug users. They're not talking, you know, about, you know, other sort of ways to transmit it. What they're really talking about is, this concept that if we could have a change in our social behavior, we could have a change in the results. And it's not blaming the victim. It's to say that we have to analyze all aspects of AIDS and HIV. We have to look at the larger social and political and economic issues. There's gender inequality. More women and children die of AIDS and HIV globally. You know, all of this stuff is very important. One of the things that they're talking about with it, with the next one on your concept sheet, it says two known ways to reduce AIDS and HIV sexually. They're talking about abstinence, which are many of you going to practice, and two, the use of condoms. Those are the things that they're talking about with the reduction of AIDS and HIV sexually. All right. Cultural bound syndromes. Let me talk about this. Cultural bound syndromes are, syndromes are when Western anthropologists describe mental illness in non-Western societies. 
So it's when Western anthropologists describe mental illness in non-Western societies. There's a need to understand mental health in other societies, especially in societies where they don't have the language for it. There are many societies globally that don't even have and don't even like the concept of mental health care, right? They're like, no, we don't talk about that. We don't get people involved. They don't have therapy. They don't have, you know, psychiatry. They don't have that. Within those situations, they might come up with their own words to describe certain things. The last term on this concept sheet is susto. Susto is a term that is used in some parts of Latin America where they're saying that it's sort of like a folk illness. It's you've been held captive by a supernatural. Your soul may has been, you know, may have been taken. Um, you know, you're, you may be held captive, you know, you know, and you may be wandering freely, you know, your soul. And in essence, susto, when we look at it in anthropology, we go, well, they live in conditions where it's stressful. It could be a mental health disorder. You know, it can be depression. It can be, you know, um, schizophrenia. It can be, there can be so many things that susto is, but we have to really understand that. And typically we know a lot of these populations that have these different terms are suffering somehow. They could be displaced. They could be lacking resources. You know, um, they, they have stress. There's lots of different things, but a lot of these societies don't have, you know, psychiatry and psychology, and they just don't think it's, it's not a culturally appropriate to them. So they come up with these terms and we have to figure out what they're really talking about. Um, and we have to really appreciate their perspective as well. All right, that is the chapter on medical anthropology. Stay healthy, right? Use some of those ethnomedical approaches if you'd like as well. See you soon. Back at you with Professor P.